Hello everyone and welcome again. So continuing our discussion about the clinical pharmacology basic principles class and after we finished our talk about the pharmacokinetics now we are going to talk about the pharmacodynamics and we mentioned that the pharmacodynamics is the study of the effects uh, of the drug on the human body or it is the study of what the drug does to the human body and for the drug to do its effect it needs targets and uh, we will explain those targets in this video the drug targets video so let's start so let's start by mentioning uh, the types of the drug targets uh, so every drug when it enters the body it has a target uh, and we have many drug targets but here we will explain uh, the most common four uh, which are the receptors which is the most common target and the ion channels uh, the enzymes which either would be intracellular or extra extracellular uh, and finally we have the carrier molecules which are also called the transporters so many drugs uh, might bind to plasma proteins or tissue proteins without producing obvious physiological effects uh, so many drugs when they enter the body they would uh, bind into plasma proteins or tissue proteins as we mentioned in the uh, di drug distribution video uh, but when they bind to the plasma proteins or the tissue proteins they would have uh, no effects whatsoever uh, some drugs have direct chemical or physical mechanisms or interact with metabolic pathways uh, so some drugs uh, if it does not have a target from the previous four uh, it might have a direct chemical uh, or physical mechanisms or interact with metabolic pathways uh, but most drugs uh, as we shall see, they work on the receptors. Uh, so let's start with the receptors. And here we have some general facts, uh, facts about the receptors. Uh, so receptors are protein molecules. So they contain protein and they are embedded in the cell membrane. And they have an extracellular part and sometimes they have an intracellular part. When the drug bind to a receptor, the drug is called ligand. So the, the drug, when they point bind, uh, we can call it ligand. It's a common way to call it. Uh, drug, drugs are also signals. We can call them, another metaphor is that we can call them uh, signals. And receptors are signal, detect, uh, signal detectors. And the binding process is signal transduction. Uh, when, when a ligand is activating the receptor, it is called agonist. So the agonist is uh, a drug that activates the receptor. When it inhibits the receptor, it is called antagonist. So the antagonist is inhibiting the receptor. Uh, so those uh, have to be memorized, the agonist and antagonist. Agonist activate, antagonist uh, inhibit or deactivate. Uh, the strength of binding between the receptor and the drug is called affinity. Uh, so the affinity is, uh, is the strength of binding between the receptor and the drug. So the more affinity the drug has to a receptor, this means the more strength the drug receptor binding would be and the less affinity the less binding uh, the occupancy on the other hand is how many receptors uh, receptors a drug occupying on the cell and it increases with increasing the affinity so occupancy it is how many receptors the drug is occupying the higher the occupancy the higher number of receptors 
the drug is occupying on the cell membrane. While uh, low occupancy means that a lower number of receptors are occupied by the drug. And it also related to the affinity there is, uh, so the higher the affinity, the higher, uh, the, higher the, uh, the occupancy. And the opposite is true. Uh, so we have four major receptors types in the human body. Uh, we have the direct ligand gated ion channel receptors, and we have the G protein coupled receptors. We have the tyrosine kinase linked receptors, and finally we have the intracellular receptors. The G protein uh, being the one uh, that is the most common. So let's start uh, by explaining each receptor type. And let's start with the direct ligand gated uh, ion channel receptors. Uh, so let, first let's explain the name. So di direct means a direct binding. Uh, ligand gated means the receptor is control controlled by ligand. Ligand uh, means a drug. Uh, ion channel means the receptor function is it lets the ions through when it's become activated uh, and receptor is a drug target. So basically the name means is that the receptor is ligand gated uh, ion channel receptor. So it, it would be activated by a ligand and it would control an ion channel. Uh, so the net effect would be the receptor would let ions go through the receptor. That's what it means. Uh, and uh, it has five transmembrane subunits and have a central channel in the middle. So the receptor would have five transmembrane uh, subunits and it would have a central channel in the middle of the receptor. Uh, yeah. And uh, example for that would be the acetylcholine receptor. So acetylcholine. Uh, a receptor so the acetylcholine would bind into one or two uh, one or two uh, chains or transmembrane subunits of the receptor so it would, it would bind on the let's say on the third acetylcholine and the second uh, and when it binds to those two it would it would open the central channel of the receptor and it would let the sodium uh, goes, uh, the sodium ions would let them go through the the central channel and into the intracellular uh, part. So from extracellular and uh, into intracellular. So more facts about the uh, ligand gated ion channel receptor. So this receptor does not, doesn't need second messenger. So it does not need second messenger as with the uh, next receptor that we will discuss, it does not need that. It, it is present in tissues needing rapid response, like the ganglia and the skeletal muscle. Uh, and it is the fastest uh, receptor type. That's why it is used in tissues needing rapid response, like ganglia and the skeletal muscle. And these receptors mediate diverse functions, including neurotransmission and muscle contraction. The same here, so it would uh, work on the ganglia, so it would be used in neurotransmission, and it would be worked work in, on the skeletal muscle, so where it would have uh, the effect of muscle contraction. Yeah, so, so that's the direct ligand gated ion channel receptor. Uh, now let's talk about the G protein coupled receptor. So the G protein is a type of protein and it is coupled to a receptor. Yeah, so this is, uh, so G protein coupled to a receptor uh, and this receptor has extracellular part which contains uh, seven transmembrane subunits and it is linked to intracellular uh, part which interact with the, when activated with the G protein. Uh, which has three subunits, so the G protein would contain 
three subunits. The first one is alpha uh, subunit, which binds guanosine triphosphate, and the second one is beta, and third one is gamma. Uh, and uh, those two, the beta and the gamma, would anchor the G protein in the cell membrane. So basically, the G protein has three subunits. The alpha one uh, binds the GTB, the guanosine triphosphate, and the beta and gamma would anchor the G protein in the cell membrane. So they would have the stabilization function. Uh, so here we have a picture for the G protein. It has seven subunits. One, uh, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Uh, and it has an intracellular part, which is, the, uh, which is connected here, connected here to the G protein, which has an alpha, uh, gamma, and beta subunits. Uh, so there is different kinds of the G protein. We have the GS, which stands for stimulatory, meaning the G stimulatory would have a stimulation effect. Uh, the GI, which is I for inhibitory, which has, has inhibition effect, and we have the GQ. Uh, but they all share the same structure, alpha, beta, and gamma. So again, we talked about the G protein, uh, the G protein structure, which contains alpha, which, do, which does the work, while beta and gamma, which, are, which stabilize the G protein to the cell membrane. And the G protein itself has different types. It has G stimulatory, G inhibitory, and GQ. So when agonists bind to the extracellular part, this leads to increase the GTB, which is again guanosine triphosphate, which is binding to the alpha subunit, uh, causing dissociation of the alpha from the beta and gamma complex. And this leads to interaction with the effector molecule, which produce secondary messenger, which interact with the specific cellular effectors, usually enzymes or ion channels, and those would lead to effect. So lead to effect. So again, the agonist would bind into the extracellular part of the G protein. So the agonist would bind into this part here. Here the, part, the agonist would bind. Uh, and this lead to increasing the GTP, which is the guanosine triphosphate, that we mentioned it bind to the alpha subunit. So the GTP is binding here. And it would be increased. And this would lead to dissociation of the alpha into the uh, and, and the alpha become free into the intracellular compartments. And that's when the, this, this would be, the alpha would interact with the effector molecule, which produce the secondary messenger. So the effector molecule that interact with the alpha would produce the, the secondary messenger, which interact with the specific cellular effectors that finally uh, those would be enzymes, ion channels, and those would lead to the effect. So G stimulatory, when activated, interact with adenyl cyclase, which is the effector. Now we have. Now we will explain each of those: the, the, the GS, the GI, and the, G, the GQ. We will start with the GS here. GS, when activated by an agonist it would interact with the adenyl cyclase. This is the effector for the GS, which increase the cyclic AMP, the cyclic adenosine monophosphate. monophosphate. So, th th so this is the secondary messenger, secondary messenger for the GS. So again, the ad adenyl cyclase is the effector for the GS. The, the cyclic AMP is the uh, secondary messenger. And this leads to activation of specific proteins. Example is B1 and B2, uh, beta 1 and beta 2 adrenergic receptors. They would 
they have the GS uh, type of G protein coupled receptor, and when they get activated, they uh, they would interact with adenyl cyclase, which increase the cyclic AMP, and this lead to the effect of the beta one and beta two adrenergic receptors. Uh, now the GI, which is the G inhibitory, it would also interact with the adenyl cyclase. It is the same, uh, the same effector as the GS. It would have same uh, as uh, GS. But the the uh, the difference is that it would decrease the cyclic AMP, while in the GS it would increase the cyclic AMP. So when it would decrease the cyclic AMP, this leads to inhibition of protein kinases. Examples is alpha-2 adrenergic receptors and M2 muscarinic receptors. So they would have a G inhibitory, the, also the effector adenocyclase, but this time it would decrease the CAMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, and this leads to inhibition of protein kinases, and example is alpha-2 and M2 muscarinic receptors. The third type, which is the GQ that we mentioned, the GQ, uh, when activated, interact with the effector phospholipase C. So this would have an effector that is called phospholipase C, and the phospholipase C, which leads to increase the ionostol uh, triphosphate, which is also called the IP3 and the diacylglycerol, which is the DAG. And those both, though both of those would work as a secondary messengers for the GQ. They would have two messengers, the DAG and the IP3, and those would release the stored calcium in the cytoplasm and lead to action. So again, the GQ interact with the effector phospholipase C which increase the IP3 and the DAG, and both would act as secondary messenger to release the stored calcium in the cytoplasm and lead to action. An example would include alpha-1 adrenergic receptors and the M1 and M3 muscarinic receptors. Uh, so G-protein coupled receptors uh, are sl slower than the direct ligand-gated receptors because of the second messenger which takes time. Uh, so we mentioned that the direct ligand gated does not have a second messenger, uh, so it would be very fast to activate, while those receptors, the G-proteins, uh, have second messenger and they would take time. So they would be slower. 70% uh, of receptors in the body are G-protein coupled receptors. So the G-protein are the most common receptor in the human body, most uh, common uh, receptor. Uh, now let's talk about the tyrosine kinase linked receptors. Uh, tyrosine kinase uh, is an enzyme. So those receptors are linked, linked to the enzyme, which is the tyrosine kinase enzyme. So they are called tyrosine kinase linked receptors. Uh, and they have two large domains. The extracellular domain, which is called the alpha domain, and we have the intracellular domain, which is called the beta uh, domain. And the beta domain is linked to the tyrosine kinase enzyme. And when activated, it will lead to activation of several proteins known as the signaling proteins. An example would be the insulin receptor. So when the insulin binds into the alpha, which is the extracellular part, it would activate the beta, which is the intracellular part. And this would lead to uh, activation of the tyrosine kinase enzymes, which lead to activation of several proteins known as signal proteins, which would do the effect. Finally, we have the intracellular receptors. The intracellular receptors are also called nuclear receptors. That's why they are 
uh, that's because they are inside the uh, nucleus they are uh, in direct contact with the DNA they are entirely intracellular so they would be they would be inside the nucleus and in direct contact with the DNA and when activated changes the, the expression of genes either increase or decrease the genes so they would have either an increment effect or decrease effect uh, hormones in general work on these receptors so hormones body hormones like uh, estrogen progesterone testosterone cortisol uh, and other type of hormones in the human body and this type of receptor is very slow it takes hours to days to activate because it has to go through the cell membrane and go to nucleus and work on gene expression which takes time and it is effect stay for a prolonged time it would have a, a prolonged effect compared with the other types of receptors uh, now let's talk about the drug receptors bond so when the drug bind to a receptor it would bind uh, using a type of bond yeah so when drug binds to receptor it make chemical bonds and we have three main type of bonds we have ionic bond which is also called the electrostatic bond uh, and the drug is charged by different charge than the receptor and leading to a strong bond because there is a transfer of electrons between the drug and the receptor so the first example of the drug bonds we have the ionic bond ionic bond is between different charges between the positive charge and the negative charge and in this way the drug would have uh, a ionic bond with the receptor uh, in form of uh, ionic bond the second one which is the hydrogen bond which is attraction between two hydrogen bonds and it is a weak bond uh, and it is like uh, for example between two hydrogen atoms so this would be hydrogen atom and this is another one this one is uh, is, uh, is connected to the receptor and the this one is connected to the drug so the drug would interact with the receptor using a hydrogen bond like that uh, the third type of bond is the covalent bond uh, which which there is sharing of electrons between atoms of the drug and the receptor and this leads to a strong bond and receptors become permanently occupied with the drug until degradation so basically uh, if we have uh, this is this one atom from the drug this is a drug atom and the, the other atom is from the receptor this is a receptor atom uh, if they make uh, a covalent bond they would uh, they would share electrons between them so we, so they would be uh, uh, in, in, in direct contact with each other the, the, uh, the, their electrons would be shared together like that uh, now we mentioned that the drug targets we have four types of drug targets we have uh, receptors we have uh, ion channels we have enzymes and we have uh, carrier molecules we finished our talk about the receptors now we will talk about the ion channels uh, so a drug can work on ion channels by many ways including uh, the drug can block the ion channel physically like local anesthetics uh, like for example if let's say we have uh, this here uh, the ion channel uh, and uh, so the drug can physically block the ion channel it would uh, be bind exactly into the center part of the channel and close it and would uh, example for that would be local anesthetics a uh, drug can bind to a receptor that has ion channel in it like the di direct ligand gated ion, uh, uh, ion channel receptor that we explained earlier 
When the drug activated the receptor, this would lead to opening of the ion channel. Uh, another example is that the drug can bind, can activate the G-protein cable receptor that we mentioned earlier, uh, stimulatory type leading to increase cyclic AMP leading to opening of the channel. And the final type is that the ion channels may be modulated by intracellular ATP. Example would be the ATPase sensitive potassium channels in the pancreatic B cells. When the ATP increases, the, the uh, potassium channel would be closed. Uh, now the third drug, drug target is the enzymes. And the drug can work on enzymes by many ways also, including drug may act as reversible inhibitor of the enzyme. Example is neostigamine is reversible inhibitor of the acetylcholine esterase enzyme. The drug may act as a reversible inhibitor of the enzyme. Here reversible, here irreversible. And example is the organophosphate, which is a toxin on the choline esterase enzyme. Uh, drugs work on enzyme as a false substrate. Uh, example is the L-DOPA converted by the dopamine decarboxylase enzyme to dopamine. Alpha methyl dopa, uh, L-DOPA is, is a natural substrate in the human body. Natural. The alpha methyl dopa, on the other hand, is a drug. So it's already written here. The alpha methyl dopa is a drug and it acts as a false substrate for the same enzyme, the dopa decarboxylase enzyme, but it doesn't produce dopamine. It does not produce dopamine as the final step. Uh, so, because the methyl group prevent decarboxylation from occurring, so alpha methyl dopa used to compete with the L-DOPA to decrease dopamine level. Meaning, we give the alpha methyl dopa to a person, the alpha methyl dopa would compete with the dopamine on the uh, dopa decarboxylase enzyme. Uh, and when the methyl dopa binds, it would not lead to, uh, it would not produce a dopamine, it would produce another substrate that would have no effect. Uh, so, this is used to treat many conditions like hypertension because we decrease the dopamine, we decrease the other uh, hormones that lead to hypertension and this way we would decrease the, the, the blood pressure and we would treat the hypertension. Uh, drugs also might go to the liver and affect the CYP450 enzymes, which we mentioned in the pharmacokinetics uh, in the uh, drug metabolism video. Uh, leading to induce the activity of these enzymes or inhibiting them. Uh, the final drug target is the carrier molecules. As the name implies, they carry stuff, so they are molecules that carry other molecules. So those are small proteins molecules that carry organic molecules across the cell membrane. When they are too large or too polar, so too large, they can't cross the, the cell membrane. Too polar, they also can't cross the cell membrane. So they would have, they would need carrier molecules to carry them through. Example would be the glucose transporters, the amino acid transporters, the urea transporters. And the drugs can increase the carrier molecules or decrease its, its numbers. And this leads to increase or decrease in transportation. And with that, we reach the end of this video. Thank you guys for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support more, you can uh, by subscribing to the Patreon uh, link provided in the description of this page or of this video. Thank you for watching and see you soon. Peace.